Hi everyone, it's uh, Sean Kidney, CEO of Applied Bonds Initiative here for today's webinar, looking at our new report, Bonds and Climate Change, State of the Market 2010. I'm talking to you from Adelaide, Australia, where I'm attending the Climate Change Adaptation Conference. This is important for a particular reason, which is that we're trying to indicate that adaptation and resilience bonds are going to become, in the next few years, a big part of the green bond scene. They need to become a big part of investors' exposure to climate-related assets, climate-related bonds, in, uh, in terms of their appreciation of the need to shift assets to climate change-related areas. So far, the focus has been very much on mitigation of clean energy, going now into rail and low carbon transport and other sectors. Going forward, we're going to see investments, bonds for investments in water infrastructure, in agricultural capital expenditure, and in various other areas that are starting to address the challenges of adaptation. We are, of course, beginning to experience climate change around the world already. Today, please feel free to ask questions using the question function in WebEx. We will try and answer them throughout, and at the end of the session, we'll have a Q&A, a free-for Q&A. We'll have two guests joining us during the session, Alima Jain from EESL in India, and Sandy Pitcher, who's the Chief Executive of the South Australian Department of Energy, Water and Natural Resources, to talk about prospects for green bonds in those two particular areas. Just first, a little bit of an introduction. The green bonds and the theme and the idea of investing in fixed income is driven by growing investor appetite in green bonds in green assets, in climate change related risk, in fact in the importance of addressing climate change for addressing portfolios. The Institute of Actuaries two years ago put out a report saying that by about 2050, institutional investors like pension funds and insurance funds can ex expect on current trajectories a wholesale decimation of the value of portfolios. That's what's driving this market. Of course, the challenge for most investors is now beginning to appreciate the long-term risks is how do you match long-term risks around climate change to what individual funds can do, which is very much a broad economic and social risk, and match it to five-year portfolio management horizons that are the norm in the pension fund and insurance fund sector. Green bonds are essentially bonds where the proceeds are allocated to climate change related investments, but the credit characteristics, the yield and risk aspects are the same as other bonds available on the market to institutional investors. It makes it a simple decision. If I were to offer you two bonds, same risk and yield characteristics, same tenor, otherwise the same, one of those bonds, the proceeds will go into assets and projects that were material to addressing the rapid transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. Which one would you take if you're concerned about climate change risk? Where investors are answering in droves. We are seeing continual oversubscription in the green bond market. With this particular report, we seek to do something further. We seek to explain to investors that beyond the labelled green bond market, which is an important discovery tool, the green bond labelling, an important discovery tool to reduce friction, to make it easier for investors to find bonds that are relevant, there is a larger universe of climate aligned bonds that can and should be considered green where one has a due diligence capability to have a closer look. As you'll see in this report, much of these are transport bonds, SNCF in France, the transport 
the leading transport issuer in France, is a pure play rail company. Because rail is such an important low carbon transport solution, SNCF bonds need to and should be considered as climate aligned bonds and should be considered for inclusion in the portfolio of investors that are seeking to increase their climate exposure. And so on and so on. Let me take you a little bit further into the report. The market has been driven by global institutional investors. That particular market involves about $90 trillion of assets under management. Initially driven by socially responsible investors, about $13 trillion of assets under management globally. It's interesting to note that in emerging markets, we also have about $5 trillion of assets under management in the pension fund and ins insurance and foundation sector. So it's fairly sizable available capital in those markets. Not necessarily adequate to the full challenge of investment over the next few years that's required shifting to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. The principles for responsible investments, a partner of ours in many projects, represents assets under management amongst its mem membership of $62 trillion. You get a sense of the scale of engagement around these sorts of issues. At the UN Climate Summit, 18 months ago in New York, Ban Ki-moon heard speeches by investors representing in total some $60 trillion of assets under management. Talking about the importance of addressing climate change for the security of their long-term long -term security of their portfolios. And most importantly, this class of investor said that they stood ready to invest in climate change related opportunities that of course address the risk and yield requirements generally set by legislative frameworks in the countries of their operation. Nevertheless, that's an important advance. The in fact the insurance industry, some 20 trillion represented in the Swiss statement at the UN Climate Summit, said that they would grow by 2020 tenfold their exposure to climate related investment. And they're reporting to the UN Secretary General every year. Frankly, they're looking for deal flow at the moment. We have investors interested in this particular space. Investors have become very aware of climate risk over the last 10 years. The International Energy Agency, for example, in its World Energy Outlook every year, publishes a report that's been very influential. In that report, they say that the world is currently heading to global warming of six to seven degrees centigrade by the end of the century. But Ibirol, the current CEO of the International Energy Agency, calls this catastrophic. The head of the German government's advisory panel on climate change agrees with the IEA's projections and says the difference between a world with two degrees warming, currently the G7's official target for maximum temperature rises, and four degrees, which he believes is the minimum we're likely to see on current trajectories, is civilization. We are in fact dicing with our children's future a high probability of substantial ecological, environmental, economic, and political disruption in the second half of this century as we see two meters sea level rises and plus Jim Hansen, the famous NASA climate scientist, has put out a paper recently where he posits a high likelihood of four to six meter sea level rises. It's the early days in that particular science, but the risks are enormous. If we were to see six to seven degrees in global temperature rises, that means an average of about 10 degrees over land. That means dramatic changes to agricultural production, particularly in the great food bowls of the world, like the Midwest of the US, like the Vietnamese Mekong Delta, the rice bowl of the world. It means dramatic changes to sea level rises in low-lying territories like the Ganges and Brahmaputra Delta, which comprises so much of Bangladesh's landmass, and some 80 million people will probably have to be on the move in Bangladesh and so on and so on around the world. Some scientists, notably James Lovelock, writing in The Guardian yesterday, posit that we will lose a third or more of the world's population. 
These are all risk factors, but they are high probability risk factors based on what the scientists are telling us today. And amongst climate scientists, there's an epidemic of climate of the pressure at the moment, as documented in some British medical journals, because they've been saying this for 20 years, yet emissions have continued to rise over that period. We have not been doing enough. Christiana Figueres at the UNFCCC, the UN's coordinating body on climate change, says that we have some five years max to see emissions going down consistently to have a chance, only a chance, of avoiding catastrophic climate change. Pension funds and insurance funds are aware of this risk and they are beginning to think how do they shift their capital in a way which is support the transition but still meet the regulatory requirements that they have to meet in different countries of operation. I'm just going to say a couple of things about opportunity before we get to the detail of the report. When you look at the International Energy Agency's World Energy Fund, there's something that really strikes you about the solutions that they posit that should be considered by governments around the world. And that is that a large chunk of what has to be done to reduce emissions, and this also applies to some of the adaptation areas, is around infrastructure and then building. You know, mobility solutions, low carbon transport is a big part of the solution. Clean energy, of course. Water infrastructure. Water consumes some 7% of electricity globally, pumping water around. California is 17%. Improvements in energy efficiency in water infrastructure can have a big impact on electricity use and reducing electricity use while we slowly make the transition to clean energy, let alone the importance of designing water infrastructure for climate resilience with the climate impacts we are already feeling in places like California, in India, in Australia, and so on. This kind of infrastructure can be designed to be investable in the same way that governments have always designed infrastructure to be investable to attract private capital whether it be capacity remuneration systems in the state to ensure base load power, or whether it be rail systems in France. The other big opportunity at the moment is that we have a world of washing capital. More capital available than ever in the history of humankind. And a lot of that capital is operating in low yield environments, which are going to make it very hard to pay pension and insurance liabilities going forward. Huge slabs of capital are sitting in negative interest rates, bonds in Germany, in Switzerland, in Sweden, in Japan, and very low interest rates in the United Kingdom and the USA. If we are to ensure that the, those pools of capital can earn yield adequate to the requirements to pay pension and insurance funds, we will need to see a greater availability of investments that suit the yield and risk requirements of those pension funds. I think A rated and triple B rated rather than triple A. Reasonably safe, investment grade, but with some yield. That sounds like an awful lot like green infrastructure from our perspective. And luckily, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, some $60 trillion of investors around the world are asking for green investments. That's the opportunity of the decade, or perhaps of the next five years, if we're to take Christiana Figueres' view about how long we have to make this transition. In fact, it's quite likely interest rates are going to stay very low for the next five years. It's a happy conjunction. What better time in the history of the planet to rework the world's infrastructure to ensure a rapid transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. Green bonds, climate aligned bonds, are merely an example of what we can do, are a bridge between the appetite of investors and the kinds of investments that need to be done. A bridge with credits and yield characteristics effectively underpinned by the acts of government and public sector bodies 
as so many bonds in this market are, and have always been when it comes to infrastructure. There is no rocket science and nothing new here. We've been doing it for 150 years. Let me take you in now to what's been happening in the climate line market. As I said, we do this particular survey each year as a way of explaining to investors what kinds of bonds are available for them to invest now, should they want to look beyond the usefully labelled green bond market. Don't get me wrong, the labelling is incredibly valuable. It's a friction reducing advice, uh, device. It makes it easier for investors to discover bonds they can invest in. But should you look beyond the labelling, you will find many other bonds. In this survey, we've used the current, these particular filters. One is the climate bond standard criteria for the kinds of assets and projects that would qualify, even though the particular bond issuers in this case haven't thought of their bonds or green. We've examined their documentations and brought them into this particular survey. We've said 95% of revenue of the companies issuing bonds or the bonds would be climate aligned. We've looked at the last 10 years of bonds. We've bought in more data around water-related bonds, around US municipal bonds, and around bonds in China, thanks to our partners, CCDC and others in China. We come up with this, a $694 billion universe of climate-aligned bonds available for investors around the world, of which around 118 billion outstanding are labeled green bonds. Some 576 billion are what we call unlabeled or climate aligned bonds, the underwater part of the iceberg of this universe. Let's drill down a little further. Very, very important thing to say about this universe and totally at odds with the equity arguments that have generally been put. In equity, you will see people say, Climate investment is very important, but has proven to be risky and volatile over the last 10 years, with things like solar stocks going up and down and a number of bankruptcies. In the bond market, this is entirely the reverse. In the climate-aligned universe, it's 78% investment grade distributed, as you can see here, between the different rating levels. This is actually the same in the green bond universe, where it's about 80% investment grade. This is very much a safe, secure market, ideally suited to the requirements of pension funds and insurance funds who currently manage such a large slab of the world's capital. Now we look at the different kinds of themes and in the climate aligned universe, a little bit different to the labeled universe that we'll come to a little later. I'm gonna pass the mic over to Bridget Poole, the market analyst who has led the development of this report. Good evening and good morning, everybody. And thank you for dialing into this webinar today. Um, as Sean mentioned, um, this, this slide is details the sectors and themes that we found um, in our client aligned universe. It's a bit surprising at first look that transport is so big in the universe. So transport is largely made up of rail issuers. Why rail? Well, Sean's explained to you already why we see this as an essential asset in the, climate, in the low carbon and climate resilience economy. But also is worth noting that rail is a very mature asset and companies and, and state-backed entities have been issuing bonds linked to rail for decades. So this is almost by default going to be a huge part of our universe. Energy, and our universe picks up um, clean energy, is, is a much smaller part, partly due to um, the maturity of the technology. So this energy part includes solar, it includes wind, and it, which is maturing as we speak more and more. And it also includes hydro bonds, which are the exceptions to that rule in that they are a much more mature technology. We have excluded, we haven't included all hydro bonds. Um, we realize that there are many issues around hydro, particularly around large hydro and particularly in tropical areas. 
So we took a um, decision, and this is based on the climate aligned, this is based on the climate criteria that we have it, through the standards work that we've been working on to exclude all hydro bonds in tropical areas or large hydro in tropical areas. Um, so those have been excluded and those in temperate zones have been included. So energy includes companies like Solar City, Wanning Renewables, Hydro Quebec. In transport, the largest issuer is China Rail, but it also includes Network Rail, SNCF, as Sean mentioned, the French Rail industry. And there's a few small quirky ones in bicycle manufacturers, but those remain quite small at this stage. Our next theme is not really a theme, it's the multi-sector, which is really a, a catch-all. It aims to catch all of those which we, bonds that we weren't able to put in a, in a separate sector. So this includes World Bank bonds, um, World Bank green bonds, IFC green bonds, which target a number of different themes. So uh, that's why they are there. Um, and the, the remaining themes, buildings and industry, include low carbon buildings, agriculture and forestry, waste and pollution, and water are quite small at this stage, partly due to um, the reason I spoke about earlier, partly because they, the issuers in these themes don't tend to issue bonds very often, so they're, they're small themes anyway. However, water issuers do tend to issue a lot of bonds, so their representation on the is probably they're underrepresented compared to um, how one, what one might think. And part of the reason for this is due to disclosure on adaptation. Um, we are only including water bonds with a very good amount of disclosure on, on adaptation. And at the moment, this is not very common in the sector. Um, so we're, we're looking at different utilities um, and local governments to see what, what um, water infrastructure they are building and how this is aligned with the low carbon and climate resilient economy. Um, and that is, so that's an evolving issue, an evolving area when it comes to disclosure, but we, we work quite hard on that, and this year we did a lot more work to identify more issues. So in the next slide, I'll give you an idea of what size bonds we're looking at. So um, as a lot of you may know, indexes and particularly different investors are really looking for quite large benchmark size bonds. And this really shows that we're, we're really getting there in the climate aligned space. So most of the bonds are greater than $100 million, and, and there, there are many that are over a billion dollars. Um, the blue lines, which is the labeled green bonds, do tend to be slightly smaller on average, but there have been some very big assurances, and this, these numbers are slightly skewed by the municipal sector, which tends to issue more regularly, but much smaller bonds. That gives us an idea of, of the size that we've, we've seen in, in the universe. Um, we've seen a broad range of currencies. The Chinese RMB is the largest due to the presence of China Railway, which I've noted, and the USD, Euro, Euro and the Pound are, um, are very large currencies in the bond market in general and, and in our universe as well. But there are also quite some smaller currencies that one might not expect to see. Um, the Indian rupee made it in chart top 10, as, as did the Swedish krona, which are interesting. It's a global story. So we're seeing bonds from all around. Um, the majority in Western Europe, US, and China, which are large bond markets. Um, but there's also issues out of the Asia Pacific region and Latin America, and that's growing. This year we did a little more in-depth research on China. That was our largest issuing currency country. It leads the way. Um, China Rail accounts for a large part of that. And it's a very big, it's a growing area for labeled green bonds, which Sean is going to talk about in a moment. The next bit of research we did was on the U.S. municipal market. This is both a growing area of issuance for labeled green bonds, that also um, makes up a large part of our climate line universe. This is, um, we did a deep dive on, on the moon this year and found um, a huge amount of bonds, particularly the clean renewable energy bonds, 
and the Qualified Energy Conservation Bonds, which are two taxable programs in the US. And you can see the states that make up a large part of that, Texas, California are obvious, they're very big states. The Colorado, that's slightly smaller, maybe less, less um, expected, and that's largely due to these programs that we picked up. I'm going to hand back over to Sean, who's going to talk about the label green bonds market. So this curious little development in the last few years has been this idea of bonds where the proceeds are allocated towards green. These are normal standard bonds like any other bonds, developed initially as an idea by development banks. And you can see, if you look back to 2013, development banks remain the largest portion or that point of the market, which basically leaked into the corporate sector in 2013 thanks to the efforts of IFC. We issued two $1 billion benchmark bonds during that year, and they were sold out in an extraordinary amount of time, one and a half hour sales, two and a half times over subscribed, and every investment banker in the world noticed. These were flat price bonds, came out same pricing as other ordinary IFC bonds, so no premium either way. As a result of that, just in one month, in November, we saw that purple strip in 2013 for corporate bonds come out. And by the time we got to 2014, whoop, look at that for a growth of corporate bonds. Not to mention the beginning of bank bonds, the dark blue at the top, and that grew again in 2015. So we've seen a fairly rapid acceleration. Last year, things didn't grow as fast as we want, largely because some predictions around US corporate market growth and Chinese market growth didn't come true or delayed. But the Chinese, having been expected to pronounce regulations for green bonds in May last year, finally published those in December 22nd, and while we've seen 7.5 billion issuance already this year, the Chinese central bank is estimating roughly 41 to $45 billion of issuance this financial year. And when we spoke to PBOC recently, they said they had 30 applications on the desks for approval in a highly regulated market. And that suggests there will be a very big second half of the year, and we have a reasonable chance of meeting the PBOC estimates. We currently, as a result, expect global issuance in 2016 to be $100 billion plus. Uh, now, the question is, can we maintain that level of growth? If we're to see capital moving in a scale commensurate with the climate challenge that we face, we believe we need to see a market of about $1 trillion a year issuance in 2020, which we can do if we roughly double the market each year for the next couple of, next three years. So that becomes, if you like, a target for investment banks and other parties in the area. Um, now, in that particular market, and just before I uh, go too far, you will see a breakdown of different kinds of assets. Clean energy is unlike in the climate aligned boss market, the biggest slice of the labeled green bond market. Uh, we've seen energy efficiency, which is mainly so far made up of low carbon buildings, energy efficient buildings around the country. So this is where a bond is issued backed by a portfolio of loans to buildings rather than energy efficiency retrofit, or sometimes by real estate trusts. And then low carbon transport, sustainable water, and so on. The big win in this sector over the last year has been around the second opinion market, which this has grown from 60% to now 80% of the market, where bonds get an independent review of some kind, a second opinion being essentially a specialist review of the bond by a climate change research center or a socially responsible investment consultant. Some, a chunk of the bonds are now using certifications from the climate bond standards, and that is growing quite quickly this year. Uh, there are still a small number of bonds, about 20%, that don't use independent reviews. Half of those, or, about, or a bit under half of those, do reference US Green Building Council LEED standards as a proxy for development green. The bulk of the none portion of this pie are municipals in the US who feel constrained about how they, uh, whether they can actually bring in an independent review because of legislative requirements about expenditures and, and costs around bonds. Many US municipalities are required to achieve the lowest price uh, for bond issuance at any one bond stage, which 
mitigates against any kind of cost that's required, such as with second opinions. We'll see if that changes this year. I want to bring in, in this case, just back to the energy efficiency slice, a different kind of issue that we expect to see in the market in the coming year. Nalima Jain is from EESL in India, which is a institution set up by the government of India, with shareholders being four state-owned enterprises, specifically with the uh, objective of rapidly growing energy efficiency lending in a broad range of areas, um, such as water pumps for rural farmers, such as LED lighting for municipalities, uh, such as fans or air conditioners for a country which is very, very hot and getting hotter. Over the last three months, we've seen an extraordinary heat wave across northern India, which has been uh, had seen a lot of deaths as then the government managed needing to cart water around to villages in trucks because water has been drying up and so on. In that kind of environment, what you're seeing is a rapid growth of ceiling fans, of air conditioners for those people who can afford it. All of that puts incredible loads on what limited energy system India has unless there can be a shift at least to highly energy efficient systems. Nalima, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, how the work you're doing impacts on people in states around India? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much, Sean. Thank you for inviting ESL in this webinar. Um, now, well, energy efficiency, uh, we, we've all known energy efficiency to provide, you know, the traditional benefits of reduced energy demand and lower green gas house emissions. Um, the way we have designed the program is it provides incentives to all stakeholders. So the consumers benefit due to lower electricity bills, the power utilities reduce demand during peak hours and do not have to invest in the program. Uh, then there is a better management of peak demand, um, um, especially when there, is, uh, when there are such constrained uh, resources in terms of infrastructure, existing infrastructure in the country. Um, so, um, so the common man uh, continues to get uh, benefited in terms of you know being supported on energy security, competitiveness, um, environmental sustainability. But then there are other macro uh, benefits that that sort of cuts across spheres that have, for example, our programs have uh, have resulted in many such benefits that that move that go beyond traditional. Um, uh, traditional uh, benefits of energy efficiency. For example, um, the manufacturing capacity in the country has grown four folds. Um, um, uh, we were doing our manufacturing capacity, the LED manufacturing capacity, we were doing about uh, you know 100,000 uh, bulbs every month, and now it has increased to 30 million per month. Uh, India's share in the LED global market has increased from 0.1% in 2014 to 15% to in 2015-16. Um, also, there has been, so far we have distributed about 125 million uh, LEDs. That means about 125 million incandescent bulbs in the residential, in the residential sector have been uh, replaced. Um, also, so what that has done is that it has reduced uh, or it has uh, resulted in 3,000 megawatt of additional capacity avoidance, uh, which uh, which translates to a deferred investment of about two billion US dollars uh, to the state government in electricity uh, generation. Also, these, what these it has are done. These extraordinary, extraordinary figures, Nalima. These extraordinary <laughs> figures, and you've only, well, you've only been around for a short amount of time as an organisation. Is that right? Absolutely, we've we've um, we've only been active since 2014, um, uh, early 2014, and that's that's the point. Uh, energy efficiency has immediate effects, has very very immediate effects, and uh, this this program has also resulted in job creation, skill development, creation of startups. So uh, it just cuts across all sectors, and um, I think uh, that is what the investors must. Uh, look at you know it's a, it's an it's an emerging market and and uh, and we must look at I mean it has moved beyond uh, just philanthropic activities it, it makes for a very very strong business case. Uh, the reason Liam I wanted to invite you onto the show is to let people know uh, an example of the kinds of ambitious programs that are happening in India 
which will become a green, a big green bond market this year, and that it frankly need to happen in every market of the world. We need these kinds of rapid growth rates if we're to have even a half chance of addressing the risk of catastrophic climate change. It needs to be in clean energy, it needs to be in, motor, in uh, sorry, transport, it needs to be in water, and it needs to be in energy efficiency, which reduces energy demand in this transition period to a clean energy economy. Now, Lima, Lima, ESL is looking at doing a green bond to help finance these transitions. Is that right? That's right. So we now have a pipeline of at least 13 billion US dollars in the next four years. And what we are looking at is to source at least 30%, which is about 4,000 uh, US dollars, um, 4,000 million US dollars um, uh, from the foreign currency loans. I mean, in this year, we are looking to uh, issue at least 200 million uh, US dollars uh, uh, foreign currency bonds, which will, of course, be, be the green bonds. So for investors in Europe and North America and Japan and Australia, what you're going to see this year is Indian sovereign level bonds coming out, which is about a triple B bond, that is investment grade, from organisations like ESL that are pioneering, pioneering the solutions that are really required in emerging markets and, by the way, now beginning to take their story to other countries around the world. And one of the things we need to see this year is we need to see the best practice examples of rapid rollout in different countries around the world then be taken to jurisdictions where that kind of energy and model needs to be applied because God knows we need an ESL in every single country in the world from Nigeria to the United Kingdom. Uh, Nalima, we wish you great success with your program. Now, just, just, just to finish up, your growth rate, your percentage growth rate per annum, Give us, the, give us the figures. Well, last year we've grown 10 times. Um, in 2000. 10 uh, times in one year? Yes. yes. How Our can you grow 10 was... times in one year? <laughs> <laughs> because that's the potential of energy efficiency in India in the developing markets. Uh, so we, we had a revenue of 10 million US dollars and now we are doing 105 million US dollars and we think that by the end of 2017, we should be doing at least 1,000 million dollars, which is about wow. one. So, so this, this exemplifies the proposition of the green bond market. An investor can get an investment grade bond, a triple B bond, in this case it'll be Indian sovereign rating. It'll be available in a currency which will suit investors, probably USD, but it might be INR with some kind of support for it. The key thing is that investments in these bonds, which will meet the risk and yield requirements of many investors, will make such an important difference to supporting the rollout of programs such as ESL's programs in India and then the lives of millions of ordinary Indians, of everyday Indians. And this is, this is what we've got to do. And of course, the same story is happening at village level solar around India with industrial capacity solar and wind energy around India with buildings, clean energy, you know, low emission buildings. And then what we're beginning to see with the railway bonds, Indian Railways has a program to electrify the country's railway system, to increase the um, freight that's uh, carried on the railway system from a third to a half. This is critically important to avoiding cars and trucks on the road. And then, of course, we've got the water sector, where the Ganges Water and Ganges Valley Commission is looking at enormous increases in clean water capacity in the area that is dominated by extremely polluted water resources. This is going to be important both from energy and from adaptation issues. Water consumes a lot of energy, the processing, the shipping it around, and so on. Think of, all, think of the fossil fuels involved in those trucks carting water from village to village that I mentioned earlier. Sustainable water resources will be a massive green bond sector in forward years, not just in India, but also in Brazil, also in Mexico, also in East Africa, and also in China, where the government has so dramatically committed to growing a green bond market. This isn't just a French, a German, a US phenomena. This is very much going to be a global phenomenon. Nalima, thank you for joining us on this call today. We'll look forward with great excitement to your forthcoming bond issuance. Thank you very much, Sean. Let me just carry you through a few more points in this particular thing. Of course, as we get bonds from India, from East Africa, 
we are going to be concerned about the environmental quality of the underlying assets. We need to have confidence to make this market a successful market in the long run. This, of course, applies in different markets like the property sector. In the US, we've already seen a, a bond which defaulted on its green credentials some years ago. Uh, in the Climate Bonds Initiative, we've developed over the last few years a multi-stakeholder program called Climate Bond Standards and Certification to provide comfort for investors in a low-cost tool that corporates and governments and others can use. It's a simple three-step certification process. There are issuers uh, working around the world with verifiers such as EY, Sustainalytics, KPMG, First Environment and so on who can ensure that the credentials of the bond are appropriate to the qualifying criteria made available. And there are 400 experts on various committees looking at key criteria around the world. Just to finish up the plug for this particular service, you can see the different governance structures involved here and the fact that the certification scheme is backed by a board representing $36 trillion of assets under management and a couple of key NGOs. Um, moving forward into the different areas of investment that are going to be pertinent to this sector. This gives you a flavour of what we call it in the climate bonds taxonomy uh, of areas where we're going to see, need to see bond issuance if we are to address this challenge facing us. We clearly have clean energy, of course, solar, wind and geothermal and appropriate hydro and bioenergy. We will need bioenergy, waste to energy, wave and tidal and of course all the grid investments that are required to connect those renewable energy resources through to the markets where the energy is required. We need energy efficient buildings really urgently. Our cities need to be transformed into cities of low emissions profiles, low energy use, which is going to mean denser cities. It's going to be cities dominated by walking and cycling and cafe life, if you like, rather than spread out cities with having to drive everywhere. This is a critical transition. It's an especially critical transition when we're looking at where all the world's new cities are going to be built. And that means India and Brazil and China and Nigeria, where huge mega cities are in the process of being formed and where whole new cities are being planned by the government. India has a program of 20 new smart cities. They need to be. It's essential that they are energy efficient and low carbon and, of course, climate resilient so they can help us with this transition. Of course, there's an industrial process that's involved, everything from cement to steel to data centers to retail. There's waste pollution and control. There's also transport. We mentioned rail. There have been a couple of bonds in the labeled green bond market for electric vehicles and hybrids already for, from the likes of Toyota, from Hyundai, from Geely Motors in China. We've seen an, all sorts of um, mass transit, including bus rapid transit systems. Information technology is not often thought of as a green or a low carbon investment, but if you're looking at a smart city, which is energy efficient, it's really important to have broadband and ICT, which are enabling frameworks for low emission, video phones, um, logistics improvements, avoided aviation for that matter, more conferencing, we have a chance of at least reducing some forms of aviation, which is an extremely fossil fuel intensive transport system. And then, of course, there's nature-based assets. We already know in Australia, where I am, the importance of adapting our agriculture, but also the importance of changing our soil practices so we can move to sequestration rather than releasing soil. That means zero tilling rather than ploughing and a whole range of other things that can be done. Soil will prove to be the greatest sequestration opportunity available for us in the planet for the next few years if we can successfully change our practices to suit sequestration. And of course forests. One, the only major country in the world increasing its forest cover at the moment is China, which has successfully, year in and year out, for the last 15 years, increased the percentage of land which has been covered by trees. This is actually an important, a very important climate sequestration, carbon sequestration activity. We estimate that globally we need to see forest cover mainly in the form of plantation forests, but not only, increased by some 50% by 2050. 
And that's a really important transition. There are business opportunities. We've already seen Stora in Sweden issuing bonds against its uh, portfolio of FSC certified forest. That should be happening in Australia as well, where we are now. Westland restoration, degraded lands restorations in China in particular, we expect to see a, a major Chinese company coming to the market later this year with a bond where they have taken desertified territory and used a whole range of techniques to bring that into dry land agriculture, which is producing grapes, which is producing herbs and so on. These are things that can be done in all sorts of countries where we see degraded land or threatened land from desertification and temperature changes. You get a sense of the enormous scale of what can be done if we are to look as we need to across all sectors of the economy in terms of this transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. I'm lucky enough to have with me in, in Adelaide joining me Sandy Pitcher, who's the chief executive of the Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources. And I want to ask Sandy about this last section around water. What South Australia has been doing, which is a state that's been at the forefront of addressing climate change, some 50% of energy, I think, generated in South Australia is coming from wind up and down, depending on how the wind is going, and a bit of solar already. And of course, they've also been, this is a state that is particularly vulnerable to climate change. It's a very dry state already, water resources are at a premium. So what do I ask Sandy, what's South Australia been doing around water related investments looking at adaptation? Please Sandy. Hi, um, well water definitely has been a, a challenge for this day and we often, all South Australian school kids are told we live in the driest state in the driest continent when we're growing up. So water's very much been part of community consciousness and I think for us talking about adaptation, water is a very interesting way to talk to a community because they already feel that sense that it is a precious resource. Um, we are at the end of a river system in Australia, so South Australia is at the end of the River Murray and so um, the River Murray being our really chief water source for the population of our big city Adelaide, very vulnerable to that river system being in drought or irrigation happening all over the rest of Australia and there being less resources available. So probably one of the biggest things we've done on a policy scale, which is Australia-wide, has been getting strong agreements um, that are legally enforceable around how we share the water allocation out of that river system. So we have a Murray-Darling Basin plan that legislated that is a national plan, so all of the different states who are part of that river system, plus um, the Commonwealth Government are in involved in that, in that agreement. And what we do is make sure that every irrigator along the way has water on licence. And we've actually developed a trading scheme. So water is traded in Australia on the market just as other shares and other things were. I believe we're one of the few countries who've got a developed water trading scheme where people can do forms of futures, um, where we can actually, um, you can trade off your water license for one year, you may want it another year. And we've got, that's made everyone be able to be a bit smarter. I mean, you might have a crop that needs to have a minimum amount of water if you're in citrus growing. However, if you've got something like almonds, you might be able to choose to do your crop one year and then another year actually think, well, the water price is better for me to sell this year. So it's enabled farmers to think about water in a very different way and it's enabled us to be able to adapt that water source around the nation and make sure we make the best of that source where it comes. So that's one, I think, pretty innovative thing that we've managed to do. Um, and, you know, it's always contested because it's a scarce resource, but it's now at least recognised as a scarce resource, not seen as something that falls from the sky and everyone should have whoever grabs it first. Um, we've also got um, water allocation planning as something that we're, we're sort of proud of as a policy driver. We actually, um, in regions around South Australia, have actually looked at our water resources in, any, in those communities and looked at the groundwater supply of surface water and others and actually made a plan for that community which everyone in that area you know, buys into. We have, you know, it can take a year or longer in the negotiation of resources and then we actually get that legislated and agreed to as well. So that um, there is a real understanding about people's rights and responsibilities around water. 
it's fantastic. It's, a, it's incredible what um, the state's done. Tell me, in terms of hard infrastructure, things that bonds could be issued against, for example, um, South Australian Water has done, I think, quite a lot around changing the nature of its utilisation of hard infrastructure. You've got a desal plant here, which is powered by renewable energy entirely. Uh, what other things have you done? So the desal plant is a great example because that changed the security mix. It meant that the city will never run out of water like we nearly did in the Millennium Drought because that River Murray source. Um, so it changed the security mix for us dramatically and we're doing power by renewable energy, but we don't use it in the year. We don't need to either because it's not the most efficient form of getting water. Um, we have a, our SA Water looks at research a lot and so one of the other areas it's looking at is how we reuse wastewater or water that's already been used um, rather than wastewater and thinking about how we can build different irrigation schemes and other schemes for different areas around that. So that's a developing area, definitely a place for bonds because there's both hard and soft infrastructure there. Um, we also have a lot of exploration in the way that even carbon sequestration sorry, carbon sequestration could happen in terms of blue carbon and whether wetlands can play a role for us. And we've got areas, a lot of areas in South Australia along the coast where we think there's real capacity to, to do things a bit differently there. So that's another area that we're looking at. But then stormwater management, I, I feel that I've left that one off and that's another huge one. I mean, we don't necessarily have the capacity that places with high rainfalls would have around stormwater, but we do, and a lot of councils as well as government have spent time building the best stormwater management that we can for the rainfall that we have, and there's a lot of infrastructure in that part of the world that would have a green bond potential as well. Fantastic. So you can just see from what South Australia has been doing around policy settings, around driving the right kind of infrastructure investments, what kinds of opportunities could come for green bonds to allow investors to invest in solid investment grade bonds that also go to addressing the challenges facing the planet? Now, that is the essence of what this whole market is about, bringing together investors' concern about long-term risks with their ability to invest short-term in instruments that still meet their risk and real requirements. It's a beautiful marriage. And of course, what we're seeing in this green bond market is a rapid growth in, as I said earlier. Where, what is next? What have we got to do next? We need to develop country green bond markets. We need to make sure that there is ambition, like South Australia's ambition, around renewable energy, around water infrastructure, that is adequate to the challenge facing it. We need to ensure that governments understand the opportunity to act in front of them. I'm now asking for questions to people. Should you have any questions, please type them in and we can actually uh, uh, respond to them while, you, while we're here. Just finishing off this slide, the first recommendation we make to any government is look at demonstration issuance so that we can show others what to do. KFW, the German Development Bank, did this in Germany. They've now issued a huge number of bonds and it has been a, exactly as we expected appropriate demonstration for other issuers that have come to market, most recently DKB Bank in, uh, in Germany. In uh, the international field, the World Bank, the IFC and the European Investment Bank, so far the largest issuer of green bonds in total, have done, served that particular role. There is a real need for governments to establish project pipelines for forward issuance. That's essentially coming up with green investment plans or green infrastructure investment plans, especially where at the moment they are nowhere near adequate to the challenge and the speed of change we need to achieve. I'll give you one example. Toronto, and I hope you're listening into this call, the Premier's Department of Ontario has had eight light rail lines on the books for many years. It is just built one and is building another. But frankly, in terms of shifting low carbon, or shifting Toronto to become a low carbon city, it's imperative we find ways to develop and finance the other eight lines as quickly as possible to get people out of cars into mass transit. We have a window where capital is 
particularly low cost at the moment for the next five years. Now is the time to bring those forward. Ontario needs to be talking to the leading pension funds, the pension funds who are willing to invest in these kinds of infrastructure, whether that be CPP or Addenda or Ontario Teachers or the others now, and working out a deal that will allow private capital to finance these important public resources that are climate change resources. Mexico City has the same problem. It has had many metro lines planned on its books, but the last metro line was built many, many years ago. Now, they need, in a city which has the worst traffic jams, at least in that part of the Americas, unbelievable traffic jams, to shift people onto efficient, clean, green, low-carbon transport. Mexico City also has a water challenge. It pumps water in from 100 kilometres away into Mexico City, processes it, and then pumps the sewerage to the ocean. This is energy intensive. That water needs to be recycled on site and trapped. We need to do everywhere for water what Singapore is doing. If you walk into a 7-Eleven or a convenience store in Singapore and buy a bottle of water, you can buy water which is straight out of the recycling system and it tastes like normal, clean water, and it sells everywhere around the world. That transition is required if we are to deal with resilience in water systems. And in every sector, this same kind of ambition is required. It's the time to do it now. That requires green investment plans. So we have one question here. Which countries or regions have the greatest potential for issuance over the next year? China, 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 and China. We have the world's third largest bond market. We have a government that is highly committed to shifting its economy to green in double quick time. We have regulators that have already rolled out guidelines and policies around green finance. We already have a central bank that is predicting more green bonds issued in the Chinese market than were issued globally last year. So we expect China to be the largest bond issuing market this year, and we expect it to be the same in the, for the next few years. That's what will be the dominant one. But I don't want to forget India, which is growing very rapidly in terms of green bond market. It has a much smaller capital market. The scale of green bonds to capital markets will be commensurately uh, strong compared to China. And so we'll see a lot of green bonds out of it. The dominant markets remain the European markets and the US market. Now, at this stage, they will continue to be strong performers. What we're seeing in the U.S. is strong market growth out of the municipal sector. New York MTA, for example, has already issued 1.3 billion odd of green bonds this year and will be coming to the market on a regular basis, they say. Another question. You spoke of, we spoke of highly committed governments. Can we give an example of a specific policy that will assist green bond market development? In China, we have green bond regulations issued now by three separate regulators, which absolutely do drive the market. In India, we have a Minister of Climate Change and Energy and Coal who has instructed eight state-owned entities to issue green bonds to provide liquidity to help grow a larger market. In France, we have a government that has actively encouraged green bond issuance by different players and also brought in regulations to try and guide the investment industry around what kinds of assets can be included in green themes. In Germany, we have a development bank that has been a huge issuer of green bonds for demonstration purposes. These are the sorts of things that will drive markets. In New York, we have a Metropolitan Transit Authority that has used the opportunity to issue green bonds to aggressively promote its crime credentials in the area. You will see ads on the New York subway showing, talking about New York MTA's green bond and the fact that it's a certified climate bond. These are the sort of things that can do it. If you want to read more about all these sort of bonds, please do look at our blog, subscribe to News from the Market, and uh, you'll be able to get information on a very regular, regular basis about all kinds of um, issuance going forward. Finishing up the tasks for government, it's important to note that we have successfully grown infrastructure globally over the last 150 years by mobilising private capital using a variety of instruments from straightforward government bonds to various forms of underpinning of private sector issuance. The toolkit exists. It is not something that requires R&D. 
It already exists in the bottom drawer of treasuries around the world. It just needs to be deployed to green. These are, this is a toolkit full of many fiscally efficient measures, regulatory measures, policy measures that will drive capital to what need to be seen as the most urgent policy priority areas globally, green infrastructure and green investment. There are many innovative things that people can do. The Chinese central bank is considering risk weighting differentials for the capital ratio requirements of banks investments. That would effectively give greater leverage for banks if they have green debt. That is a significant encouragement to banks to lend more to green. We can look at tools like that in different sorts of areas. To wrap up, in Paris we launched a thing called the Green Infrastructure Investment Coalition. It is a platform to try and encourage these kinds of investments and to encourage governments to develop green investment plans that will deliver on the National Climate Change Commitments, or INDCs, that were promoted at the COP, the Climate Change Conference in Paris in December. This is the important next stage to build on the incredible momentum generated by the last Climate Change Conference. 186 countries around the world prepared climate change plans for the first time in history. Now, they've got to be made real. That requires green investment strategies. We held a forum in London last Thursday bringing Indian banks and other potential issuers of green bonds to meet investors in London. These kinds of discussions need to be had with many countries to encourage inter-country capital flows, which is one of the things that's got to happen. I mentioned earlier, investors in Germany, investors in Japan, investors in the US don't have access to yield in government bonds that are going to meet their requirements to pay pension funds and insurance liabilities in the future. We need a pact between investors and governments to create infrastructure investment opportunities in emerging markets where the bulk of the world's growth will be in the coming years that will provide yield for pension fund investors but at a risk that they can wear given their fiduciary regulations they have to operate under. That's what's got to be done. You will see us working in the sector with India, Brazil, Mexico, and some Chinese sectors in the coming year. But this is something that many actors and many parties are beginning to work on and will hopefully dramatically scale up their efforts in the coming year. I think that's the end for today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. You can download the report from our website at climatebonds.net in PDF form. Uh, you, will, you will also be able to get access to images and so on through our blogs and our tweets. Please do subscribe. Our tweet is uh, at Climate Bonds for more information. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate to email us or contact us on the climatebonds.net address. Uh, we look forward to your involvement, to the involvement of banks and investors and governments around the world in making this market a market that makes a real difference to addressing the very real and urgent challenges of, the, of climate change. We need to shift capital and we need to shift capital very quickly. Luckily, we have the capital. Luckily, we know where it's got to be shifted. So now it just comes down to the finance sector to bridge the gap between those two. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks Bridget for presenting we look forward to talking to you again in the near future.